Thank you, choir. Wasn't that a blessing? Nate, I think you left your Bible up here, so I want to be so kind to make sure you have something to look at today while you're listening to the sermon. I don't know about you, but uh, yeah, I just was sitting there in the front pew and not sure what was going through your mind because I didn't turn around and look at you, but uh, I was just thinking, man... I could stand to have another choir piece, and then another one after that, and, <laughs> and the choir's probably saying, you just don't know how long it took us to get this one ready. <laughs> so anyhow, what a treat, what a bonus to have a choir at Standing for Gap. Thank you, choir members, for adding that part, singing, 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 I like that. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, and we have a lot of reasons to sing today, don't we, when we think about how good... God has been to us. Well, happy Sabbath to each of you today. If you're visiting here for the first time and uh, you just don't hardly know anybody, uh, I just want to tell you, uh, Standing for Gap, uh, yeah, is a very friendly family church. And uh, if you're one of those people and you're looking for a church home, uh, there's a card in front of your pew that you can fill out, and you can give it to me personally or Nan, or put it in that brown box, and we'll do what we can uh, to help you uh, to have a church home if you don't have one already. I will share this. Uh, sometimes this may come, it could, could uh, possibly come across as if I'm tooting our own horn today. Um, it's, I guess it's okay to have a, a horn toot, right? <laughs> Art, Pastor Shue. Uh, but you understand when I share what I'm going to share with you right now, it's not for Standing for Gap Church glory. It's for God's glory, all right? Um, I, maybe I need to say that again. When I share what I'm sharing with you today, this is for God's glory and not for our glory. I did receive a picture this week uh, in the mail and you cannot see this card. It's a card, a postcard with a picture in the front. Um, and that's the picture up there on the screen. Uh, some of you recognize uh, those individuals. Uh, I'm sure if you've been attending Standing for Gap uh, for a number of months here, you'll recognize all of them. Just in case there's some of you that uh, are new, uh, the guy in the middle standing next to Pastor Ian and myself is Pastor Brandon Ford. Pastor Brandon Ford was our summer intern, doing the same thing that uh, Tim Gosser is doing this summer. He was doing that last summer. Um, and he came on board when the school year started last year and, and became one of our externs. So he went from intern to extern, and now he's a pastor. <laughs> so it's, it's working out for uh, Brandon. Uh, he, he's actually in the Carolina Conference, and he preaches his first sermon next Sabbath. I thought it was today, Ian, but it's next Sabbath he'll be preaching, so we need to pray for Brandon. Well, his mom and dad, they visited here a number of times. They happen to be from Florida, not a bad place to be from. <laughs> Maybe not right now necessarily uh, in the winter time, but uh, we have a number of family and friends uh, I know in this church that enjoy going uh, down to Florida. Well, they attend a church down there. Uh, Evidently, it, it, it's a really good church. Um, so I think it was their hope and prayer that when Brandon went off to Southern, that he would be able to find a church home that he could come to uh, and be a part of. And I think. As you listen today, uh, mom's prayers, dad's prayers were answered. So this is just a little thank you uh, to me, first of all. Uh, what a blessing you've been to Brandon. Um, and then she continues here, and she says this. She says, what an awesome church you have, too. And I have to say amen to that. She's talking about my church, but your church, too. Um, what an awesome church you have. Uh, he always said, Brandon always said, the church was so much like his church um, that he has in Florida with friendly people, and he always felt, felt loved and at home here at Standing for Gap. Isn't that cool? <laughs> so I know it's probably hard to pat yourself on the back, uh, but instead of doing that, I just think, just point up and say, yeah, when somebody scores a touchdown, you know, they give God the glory. That's what we're doing today. Uh, but yes, uh, Brandon, he felt that here. She says, uh, Brandon will always miss being here. Uh, so he's excited to work for the Lord. Uh, 
And she says again, thank you again, and may God bless you, and then adds this, and your church family. And then she signed her name. Why do I share that with you? Because again, as I've said many a time from this pulpit here, <laughs> like I said last week, you would expect me to say this. I think Standard for Gap is a wonderful church. I think we have a wonderful church family. And I do believe it's because of people like you that, that we're making a difference in the lives of young adults like Brandon. And some of you know the luxury that we have here at Standard for Gap is because we're so close to Southern Adventist University. We have these young men, and we had a young woman a while back that come over and help us. I think that's pretty neat. And so uh, you guys have partnered with me. Uh, and for a while, Pastor Shu was working with them, too, before I came. And so this has been a rich tradition here, these externs that come, and they work with Standard for Gap Church, and uh, eventually they graduate, and they go off to pastor their own church somewhere. But they have good memories of what they received when they were here. And so I just want to commend church family, you, for what you do to make this church what it is. Um, yeah, don't stop doing what you're doing. Continue to love um, continue to care, and especially, yeah, pray for all of our extern pastors, and also pray today for um, our assistant pastor, Pastor Ian. Come on up. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to invite him up to talk about something that I know that he's excited about, and your job, Pastor Ian, I know you're excited, but you got to get the rest of us excited about what's happening this coming Monday. So share with us what's starting this Monday at 6.30 p.m. I will try to be, a, my voice will be try to be as exciting as possible. <laughs> Unfortunately, coming back from vacation, I was really tired the first day, really great the next day, and then I got sick the last two days. So my voice is completely gone. It's still here. But this Monday starts our Vacation Bible School program. Um, it is entitled The Mighty Fortress in Jesus, The Victory is Won. The entire premise behind this Vacation Bible School is teaching children, both young and old, that in Jesus, in so many different ways, we can receive the victory. Amen. Whether that's from victory from people that are being mean to you at school, or victory from the sins that you have committed in your life, no matter what, Jesus has given us the victory in those areas of our lives. Cool. So, Pastor Ian, can you tell us a little bit about the age group that you're looking at? Who can come to VBS? Yeah, the age group for our Vacation Bible School is grades 1 through 6 or ages 6 through 12. Now, if you have a younger child who wants to come and attend Vacation Bible School, you're more than welcome to bring that child, but the parent must be attending with the child to be there. All right? So that's ages 6 through 12 age uh, grades one through six. Now, if you're 13 or older, I would love it if you'd come to me and ask if you want to volunteer because we have a lot of youth actually really involved in this program this mm -hmm. year. Uh, so we're really, uh, really excited about that. Uh, a lot of the youth are going to be helping out with our play, helping out and escorting the kids all over our Vacation Bible School program and in all the different areas, whether it's the games, whether it's the snacks, whether it's the crafts, uh, the youth are going to be fully engrossed in this program and helping these kids see Jesus. So, Pastor Ian, I know you've been building a team. Uh, you mentioned the youth that are helping you, and there's some adults that are helping you also. Are you to the point now that you don't need anybody else to help? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I could use every single person that I can find. Okay. Any, anybody that wants to come, even if you show up the day of, I will put you somewhere. I will put you to work. I will never find too many people to help out with Vacation Bible School. All right, so suppose you're an adult here and you cannot commit to every night next week, but you could give at least one night. Um, how should they handle that? How should they handle that coming just for... Just, is that okay if they yeah. come for one night? If, they come, if you need to only come for one night, I am perfectly fine with you guys coming for one night. That means you're helping out with one <laughs> night of VBS. And that is very helpful to these kids. It's helpful to all of our staff. It's helpful to me. So I, if you can only come out one night, I highly encourage come out one night. Let me know afterwards what night that you can help. And I'll uh, put you down. 
And one more question today. Pastor Ian, when you think of a dream, um, as far as what you would like to see happen in this one week's time, what would be your dream when the day, when the, the, the vacation Bible school ends on Friday evening, what would be your dream um, that you would like to see come true? I think my dream would be twofold. Um, first and foremost, we're ministering to the kids who are coming to this vacation Bible school. For those kids who are coming out in the community, even the kids who are in our church coming, we want them to see Jesus. Amen. That is my utmost uh, first part of my dream. Not only that, but I think the second biggest part of my dream is everybody who's involved in this to see Jesus. Amen. Because with all the youth who are getting involved in this, this is the opportunity to actually live up to their faith to live up to showing these kids about Jesus. Because we're not doing this for ourselves. We're doing this completely for Jesus and teaching these kids about Jesus. Amen. So if I have to say anything about the dream that I'd love to see that Friday evening, not only do the kids accept Jesus into their life, but our youth and our adults accept Jesus into their life again, whether they're rededicating their lives or maybe making that decision for the first time. Amen. So it's very clear that Pastor Ian and his team have a dream of seeing kids come to know Jesus. Here's the next question, and that is, how can that happen unless someone brings them? Now, we all know that we, there's flyers, there's inserts. Pastor Ian, I'm sure you have something there in the foyer that they can pick up. I think it was an insert last week in the bulletin. So there's those kind of things there that people can use to invite uh, friends, family to this. Uh, uh, but any way, any, any way that you can connect with people and let them know about this, Facebook, whatever, yeah, how can they come to know Jesus if they never received an invitation? Plain and simple, right? And so today and tomorrow, we have two days left, and so if you know of someone, even if they can't drive here, if you could pick them up or ask somebody to partner with you to make sure they get here, that would be much appreciated. Since Pastor Ian believes this is a spiritual thing, uh, he, he, he knows that in order to do it, to do it well, to do it so that Jesus can smile, that we need the help of heaven to do it. And so today, I'm going to invite not just Pastor Ian, but anybody that's already signed up to Helm, his helpers, his team, to come to the front. And today, we're going to have a special prayer for the VBS staff. So please come right now. Don't be bashful. Um, and I'm going to invite the rest of the congregation to join us in prayer. So, uh, yeah, just come to the front. Thank you so much for those that are coming. Um, there's some that are not here today that I know that will be here. But, uh, yeah, we want to have a special prayer of dedication for them. So as we kneel right now, church family, if you could kneel also and we'll pray. Father, Thank you so much that you gave us the privilege to do this work of helping others come to know you. We know the angels could have done a lot better job, but you didn't ask the angels to do this job. You asked us. And VBS in some ways may seem like a really small mission field, but the truth of the matter is, if Pastor Ian's dream comes true, that on Friday evening, each of these children, in some form or fashion, saw Jesus, and Jesus changed their life. But not just the child's life. We must not forget that this can trickle down into the home, too, to mom and dad. And we're not sure where you want to take it, but we pray that your spirit may lead. I pray that you'll baptize each one of these leaders, um, especially Pastor Ian. Uh, give them strength. Give them guidance. Protect them. Protect our church. Um, and help us all, if we can't help, help us all to remember VBS this week in our prayers. We also pray today for Joan Wilson. We know she's struggling right now with a heart issue. Uh, be close to her today. Kevin, Father, and Mary, uh, we pray for them today. Our dear, sweet Judy Phillips also, as she's dealing with heart issues, Lord. Um, and all those, Lord, that are struggling and on our prayer list, pray that you be with them. Um, and Tina, Father, too. Thank you so much for hearing our prayer and blessing us now as we get ready to go into your word. And may your spirit lead in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
So the sermon title today is a little different from last week. If you were here, I preached about the pearl of great price. Today, it's the peril of great loss. And so today, hopefully, you brought your Bible. Uh, boys and girls, I'm going to be sharing a number of words through this sermon. But the word that I especially you, want you to think about, remember, is try to keep track from this time forward how many times I use the word loss. As you think about great losses today, think about losses in your life that you've encountered. How many of you have ever had or received a pink slip before. You ever received a pink slip? <laughs> well, that's not the kind of loss anybody wants to have, especially when finances are tough. You never want to have your employer come to you and say, you know what, we're cutting back, and we're not going to be able to keep your job. That's a big owie. Hurt, that hurts. How about loss of health? You ever had a time in life when you weren't feeling well? And you had to be admitted to the hospital. Ooh, I mean, just not good. Uh, maybe it wasn't you. Maybe it was a loved one, a spouse, uh, uh, a child, uh, a mother, a father. Yeah, I've spent enough time this week in Erlanger to know that Erlanger is a place where I don't want to go eat supper. All right? <laughs> and it's not because of the food necessarily. It's just because I don't want to be sick. All right? <laughs> And as Pastor Shu said earlier, he said this, the, in his prayer, this world is getting worse and worse. And so, yeah, not a good place to be. In fact, I can tell you this as I look at this guy. Sometimes you don't appreciate how healthy you are until you don't have it. And so health is a tremendous gift. But when we lose it, ouch, that really hurts also. But think about loss of life. Some of us lately have had to put loved ones to sleep. We've had to lay them into the grave. Um, yeah, not easy. Even if it was years ago when you did it, it's still not the same when that loved one or friend's not there anymore. We all know the story just about a month ago of Elliot Ransinger, who was on his motorcycle. It was a Sabbath afternoon. Who'd, 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 who had been on this road before and knew how to ride a motorcycle. If anybody could ride a motorcycle, he could. He was experienced, had been driving, riding a motorcycle for many years. And then all of a sudden, something fluke happens. He loses control of the bike, and bang, that's it for Elliot. And so I was there at his memorial service, and, 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 and everybody, all of his, a number of his friends came from out of state, uh, from Michigan, many of them, and were grieving uh, because of the loss of a, a, just a young guy, just finished his freshman year at Southern Adventist University. And so loss of life. How about loss of house? Isn't that something? You look at this. This is Hurricane Sandy. This lady, I uh, don't know much about her, but I can tell you something about her house. This house was 40 years old. And when Hurricane Sandy hit New York a number of years ago, it, it just totally demolished many of the homes there. And so today, as you see the tear coming down her eye, yeah, you can kind of in a way understand how that would be to have your house just collapse. I mean, think about that. The house with all of your possessions, the place where you slept last night if you did sleep, uh, the place where you eat your meals, the place where you socialize, yeah, just crumbled to the ground. There it was. Well, today, friends, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about loss. I'm going to talk to you very specifically about the greatest loss the greatest loss that you could ever encounter in your lifetime. But before I go there, I want to take you to a really good picture. <laughs> I'm going to say that again, a really good picture. Because when I, when, when I think about the future, this is what I think of. I think of someday this is going to happen. Now, I would like to suggest to you that I think that that could maybe happen in my lifetime, but here's the good news. Even if it doesn't, I'm still going to follow Jesus because here's what I do know, and that is if I do have to go to the grave and fall asleep in Jesus, when I wake up, guess, guess what the first thing is I see? <laughs> I see Jesus. 
I see the second coming. So, the, the, the whole thing about the second coming, we as Seventh-day Adventists, we preach it, uh, it's in our name, Advent, uh, yeah, we talk, we sh- at least we should talk about it, uh, we probably should talk about it a little bit more than we do, uh, we cannot forget that one day Jesus is coming again, he is, I really believe that, he is going to come, he's going to burst through the eastern sky, and you know what, as I look at the Bible, I get the picture I get the picture that when he comes again, there will be some people that will be very excited about it, rejoicing to see Christ come again, smiling. Oh, thank God you're here, Jesus. Praise the Lord. We can't wait to see you. That's one picture that I get. But if I'm faithful to the Scripture today, and I think all of you, many of you are Bible students, and you want to be faithful to the Scripture, I understand this, and that is, is that as much as for some, the second coming is a great gain, for others, it is a great loss, a different reaction. Some excited to see Jesus come again. Others, wow, this is not what we wanted to see and ready to run the other direction. How do you know that, Pastor Mallory? Well, let's go back to that text in Revelation chapter 6, verse 16, and listen to the people that aren't ready for Jesus to come again. Listen what they, or watch what they say here on the screen Revelation chapter 6, verse 16, notice it says, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Whoa. Fall on us? Mountains? Rocks? Fall on us? Let us hide? Because we don't like whose face? Jesus' face? Friends, this is a picture of what I call the greatest loss that you could ever experience. And that is Jesus comes again and you're not ready to meet him. Yes, every other loss is hard. To lose a job, uh, to, to, to lose your health. Yeah, to lose a loved one in death, they're all hard. But this, to me, is the hardest, to lose out on the trip of a lifetime. I'm talking the vacation of all vacations, friends. (laughs) This is going to be one great ride. But the sad thing is, the scripture says, there will be one group of people there that won't get to go on the trip. Notice what it says in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 20. Will you read it with me? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Ouch! The harvest, Christ coming to take his people. It's all done. But guess what? We're still here, and they left. Whoa! So sad. And so today, as we talk about this... There's, there's a lot of questions that come to mind, at least for me. Maybe not for you, but they definitely come to my mind, and that is, who in the world will be in that company of people that will be left behind? Who will be there? Well, you know what? The Scripture doesn't really necessarily say specifically who's not going to heaven. And you know what? Let me just share this with you. And that is, if the scripture doesn't say who's going to heaven and who's not, guess what? We shouldn't either. But how many times we like to make judgment calls about certain people? Well, that person's going to heaven, but oh, no, not that person. But friends, until the road is called up yonder, you don't know. <laughs> you don't know. In fact, the surprise of all surprises is you get to heaven and you find out someone that you wrote off is there. And even more of a surprise is someone that you thought was going to be there is not there. 
So let me make this clear. It's not our job to decide who goes to heaven. Let's leave that up to him. He does a lot better business at the saving business than any of us ever could. Some, Nate mentioned the thief on the cross. Oh, praise the Lord that there are stories that, hey, before he breathed his last breath, yeah, he made that decision to follow Jesus. I like that. But friends, don't bank on that that you're just going to play around and do your own thing, and then hopefully everything will kick in before you breathe your last breath. No, don't use that. If you can avoid it, no, yeah. Make sure that Jesus is first and foremost in your life. So while we cannot, while we cannot make an accurate assessment of who's going to be in the company that doesn't go with Jesus to heaven, we can kind of come to uh, what I would say a, a good guesstimate. A guesstimate, meaning that, yeah, it could be wrong, who knows, but this is a good guesstimate. How many of you would agree with me that when it comes to people that are, going to, that are not going to heaven, how many of you would agree with me that a wicked person will not go to heaven? How many of you would agree? Someone that has rejected Jesus, let me put it that way. And you could find biblical support for that. They rejected Jesus, and they never accepted him, the plan of salvation. Easy, right? We, we could all conclude that that person, outside of a miracle of God, which he can do again, again, it's up to him, we would all say that. So in the company, when Jesus comes again, there are some people, I'm sure, that just never wanted to have anything to do with God. Their heaven was this world. They put all their stock, everything into this, and that's all they wanted. So they never came to church. They never opened their Bible. Yeah, they never even prayed. I think you could make a, a, a good guess here that that kind of person would not go to heaven. But as you look at this company, this is where I'm going to really challenge you here today. As you think about who's in this company today, could there possibly be other people that maybe you wouldn't think would be left behind? Hmm. Could it be possible that when Jesus comes again, that not only will the outright wicked person be left behind, but even some people that were religious will be left behind. Oh, religious? What are you talking about, pastor? Somebody that maybe, maybe attended church. Somebody that maybe, at least looking at them, you would suspect because of what they do, that they would be an automatic. They would go there for sure. You would never have any doubts. Could it be, friends, that even in the company of the loss, the greatest loss ever, there will be people that thought they were going to heaven, but they did not go? And if you say yes to that, then here's the question next. How in the world could someone be so deceived? How could someone come to this point and be so deceived, thinking that they were going, but God leaves them behind? How could that ever happen? Oh, today, friends, I want to challenge you to look at a story. It's called the Sor Sermon on the Mount, the parable of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, many parables, that is, uh, here in this section of Matthew chapter 7. Hey, I'm going to invite you at this time. I'm not going to put these verses up here on the screen. So open your Bible right now. I'd like to invite you to open your Bible or use your device, whatever works well for you. And we're going to take a look at what Jesus said about the topic that we're talking about today. In, in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus is teaching, you can see the picture here, some 2,000 years ago, 
And it's interesting, the audience is very mixed, uh, disciples are there, uh, yeah, there's many there that day, um, and obviously you can't really understand everybody that's there, uh, but this is one thing that I thought was very interesting as I was thinking about the people that were there. <laughs> I get the feeling that there were some people there that day after reading through all of the verses related to the Sermon on the Mount. I think there were some people there that felt like, you know what, we were the automatics. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're automatic. You know, God's going to save us automatically. Um, and, and, and so the, the picture that I get here is Jesus, oh, don't you love this? Jesus is taking people that have confidence in themselves, and he's putting them in a place where they can look beyond themselves and see that the real way is his way and trusting in him. Oh boy, we could talk more about that as far as the thinking of some of the people in Jesus' day. <laughs> Whether you realize it or not, some of the hardest people to get through to in Jesus today were not the outright wicked. It wasn't the outright heathen that he struggled with. It was the so-called religious people. The, the people that thought they knew it all. Pharisees, we could go down the list. Those were some of the hardest people. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know, if that can happen some 2,000 years ago, that, that we can get so focused in ourselves that we're blinded. Oh, God, help us. Help us today to listen to the teacher as he speaks to us because none of us today, I don't think you would, none of us today want to come to the end and see our loved ones disappear and go to heaven and us left behind. No one today wants to be in that position. So Jesus today, he speaks to not just the generation 2,000 years ago, but he speaks to our generation too. He says, not what? Everyone. Not everyone. Verse 21. As much, as much as God would like to say everyone, he says not everyone. I think if it was God's desire, if you understood his heart, yeah, he would want everyone to go with him to heaven. But the Bible plainly says, not everyone. And then he goes on to say the kind of people that would represent the not everyone's. Notice he says, who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many, not the first time that word is mentioned in this chapter. Many, also mentioned in verse 13 if you want to study it later. Many, it says. Now, when you say, when we think of many, if, if, I, if I say many kids are coming to vacation Bible school on Monday, what do you think of, church family? <laughs> uh, my thinking is, is that the sanctuary, Pastor Ian, will be full. Uh, many will be there, all right? And notice here that same words used in this context. It says, many, not a few, but a lot. A many will say to me then that day, in that day, thank God for the Sabbath school quarterly, which helped us to understand about that day. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Now, friends, if you didn't know the story like most of you do, if someone was doing all these things, you would think what? Automatically. What would you think? <laughs> Hey, let me just add to that. If someone is up front here preaching like I'm preaching to you today, 
you would think automatically that they got everything moving in the right direction, right? That would be your logical conclusion. So essentially, you're seeing spiritual activities. Activities for someone that they call who? They call him Lord. <laughs> Lord. Implying, I'm your servant. And it's not just once, but it says, Lord, Lord. Emphasis being that, hey, you know who we are, Jesus. We've done this thing for you. We've done that thing for you. And you know what? It gives you the impression that they were just checking off. Checking off thing after thing that they'd done for God. And then verse 23, the greatest loss you could ever experience. Verse 23, and then I will declare to them, ooh, listen, watch, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Wow. I never, what? I never knew you. Jesus, what are you trying to say here? I don't really understand everything, but please show us what this is teaching. Never knew you? My guess is that when he said this statement, it wasn't as if he didn't know who he was talking to. So surely, Bob, as I look at you over here to my right, I know your name. I'm sure for Jesus, he knew their name. And he probably knew much more about them. But when he says, I never knew you, it makes me think, there's a level of relationship that they did not have with him. That level of relationship for them worked. They were content and they were comfortable with it. But Jesus says, it's not working for me. Never knew you. In a lot of ways, this is saying... As much as you thought we were friends, we weren't really that close after all. Deception. My, my journey on this, this text, I've struggled with it. Because whether you realize it or not, each one of us could be in this category. At some point, friends that those exact words could be said to us. I never knew you. What, 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 what does that mean? Well, it wasn't too long ago. I would say probably, probably a, about 10, 15 years ago. I had something happen with the person that I thought that I was really in a good relationship a right relationship. <laughs> um, you, you couldn't, at least as far as my perspective, I thought everything was hunky-dory. No issues. And that person happened to be my lovely wife. I happened to come home one day after working many hours, nonstop, person after person to see I was winning the world for Jesus, but I was losing my own family. So sad. It's hard for me to even admit this. And I'd heard the stories before. Oh, whatever you do as a pastor, make sure you never forget your family. And here's the thing. Listen to me. I thought I was being a good husband. I thought I was being a good daddy. I was blinded. I was deceived. And so while I'm out shaking 
shaking the hands of church members and non-church members, community members, and, 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 and fellowshipping with them. I go home that evening, and I talk to my wife, and I could tell something is, is, was really wrong. Now, I don't know gentlemen here today, those of you that are married, uh, do you have the IQ enough to tell when there's a problem in your marriage? Do you, can you tell that? <laughs> Dick, I didn't ask you to be <laughs> so public here. Just, just raise your hand, all right. <laughs> Don't raise your hand, all right. <laughs> so I, I knew, that by the, by the nonverbal cues, I knew that there was problems. And so, you know, I, I thought, what is, could I do here? You know, I can give her a foot massage. Usually that helps, but I don't think a foot massage would work this time. And, she, and I said, sweetheart, what's wrong? And this is what she said to me. I'll never forget the words. She looked at me, paused before she said something, and looked at my, in, in my eyes, and she says, I don't know you. I don't know you. Does that mean she didn't know I was Mickey Mallory or her husband? No, it didn't mean that. What it did mean is that because I was busy doing all these other things for so many other people, that the relationship I thought was secure wasn't secure. And she was essentially saying that we have nothing. We have nothing. As much as you may think I'm such a happy wife and, and rejoicing with you and everything, that's not the case. I'm not. I don't know you. And so, when I went to this verse and thought about Jesus and his love for the church, I realized in a lot of ways, he's just like my wife. He's saying to a church that was busy, a church that was doing all kinds of things, that I don't know you because we don't have a relationship. Oh, friends today, could it be that that same message would ring out loud and clear to us today? Oh, I appreciate the stuff you do, Jesus would say. I appreciate your efforts and all of that. Yes, I'm sure he would say that. But really, at the end of the day, what is he looking for? What is he looking for, church family? He's not looking for all the motions. He's looking for your heart. I'll say it again. He's looking for your heart. And so today, this whole story brings up the biggest question of the morning and now the afternoon. And that is, does Jesus have your heart? I, last week, the pearl of great price. He did everything for you. Did you walk away without giving your heart to him totally? And so, friends, he goes on here and talks about how he wants us and them to have the relationship that's built on him. He uses the building here, the house. Verse 24, Matthew 7. Two buildings, two builders, two houses. It says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will like him to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain descended the floods came and, and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall. It did not do what? It did not fall because it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these scenes of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and, and beat on that house just like a hurricane. And then it says it fell. And the next part in verse 27, it says, great was its fall. 
<laughs> as much as you, you can wrap your mind around a physical structure, a house being built here, that all makes sense. Uh, some of you have had a chance to build your own house and all of that. Th- that makes sense uh, here that you would not build on sand. You would build on something solid like the rock. But l- let me just share with you this, and that is when you think of, of just the physical building here, you're missing the point of the story. For friends, Jesus is trying to teach us and them the importance of another house, and that is your faith. The house of faith. Building, building a house of faith. So I ask you today, where, where are you building your house? Bible says the foundation, first of all, the first one was rock and it stood. The second foundation, the second house was sand. Obviously, the one that was on sand, that was a great loss because it didn't have what it took. But the one that stood on the rock stood strong through that storm. Where are you building your house? Building it on Jesus, the solid rock, or building it upon sand, which in a lot of ways is pretty much what we call self. Building it on you, yourself. Where are you building that house? I want to share with you today a little picture. Let's say, for example, that I came to you and I said to you that you could have this piece of property to build your house on. How many of you would be takers here today? Just think about it. I mean, looking at it. (laughs) Looks pretty, doesn't it? (laughs) Some of you are jumping the gun here on this one. (laughs) I mean, from first glance, would you admit this is a pretty good place to build a house? I mean, you've got trees and you've got a field here. Yeah, really nice. But if, if I told you this next thing, would it change your mind? I know a lot about this place because it sits pretty close to where I live. It's a floodplain. And beyond the trees is a creek that floods. Right now, it's dry, and the ground is hard. But when that storm comes and it rains for days on end, that becomes a little river in there. Now, let me ask you, how many of you would like to build your house on this piece of property? I was thinking that would be the response. (laughs) Nobody would want to do it. And why would you not want to do it? Because someone told you this is not the place you want to do it. It was the word, the word of a friend, the word of your pastor that told you don't do that. And so as you go back to the Sermon on the Mount, the the biggest thing that I see is that as far as looking at the people, one actually listened and responded, and so his house stood strong. But the other one, he listened, and then he went out, And he built his house on a floodplain. Do you see how it's not just listening, but it's also doing something about what you just heard? And so what is Jesus talking about? Inspired commentary. I love the book, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. Notice what it says here. Read it with me. Let's go. In receiving the word, we receive Christ, and only those who thus receive his words are building upon him. Continuing, set your heart, set your heart to obey what you do know of the Word of God. His power, His very life dwells in His Word. As you receive the Word in faith, it will give you power to obey. As you give heed to the light you have, greater light will come. (laughs) Again, going back to the Sermon on the Mount, building on the rock is building on the? The Word. Listening and doing, responding to what God says in His Word, and then building on the sand is listening but choosing not to do what God says, choosing not to respond. Mm. Notice what this, I have to bring this to a close, so much here, but going back to that book, this is so important that you see this because there's some people There's some people that feel 
They're definitely not here. They're over here. Is there any hope for people that are building on a bad foundation? Well, here it is. Watch it with me. You who are resting your hope on self are building on the sand. Ah, I can't wait to the next word. I don't know about you, but I need the next word. This is the gospel, the good news of God. And Pastor Shu. It's still full of hope there. But it is not yet too late to escape the impending ruin. She says these words some hundred years ago. It's not too late to escape the impending ruin. So that means that if, if you've been building over here in the sand, that means you can do the leap you can come over here and start building on the rock. Isn't God good? So you may have thought at the beginning of this sermon, oh boy, I'm, I'm, there's just not much hope for me. But the good news is there is hope for you. Going back to the same chapter, Matthew 7, 7, read it with me. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. What is Jesus trying to say? He's trying to say to anybody here today that's been building on the sand, all it takes is just opening the door and I'll come. I'll sup with you and I'll help you build on myself. <laughs> that's the good news. And so today, concluding the sermon, I don't know about you, but I still think the door's open. I still think the door is open. So that means if the door is open, you can still get in. Before the flood came for the ark, when the door was open, you could still get in. And so it is before Jesus comes the second time. The door is still open. You can get in. Trust me, you can get in. And today, I must admit, I'm thinking about tomorrow being a big day, Father's Day. <sighs> Father's Day, where we take time to remember all the fathers. Well, let's do this. Let's not just think about the earthly fathers, but let's also think about the heavenly Father. Remember Jesus' baptism, the baptism of Jesus. Remember, the, the Spirit of God descended as a dove. The Spirit of God was there. The Trinity was there. Where was the Father? How did you know the Father was there? You remember? It's because you could audibly hear His voice. And what did He say? Read it with me. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Wow, that's a proud dad. And today, friends, how is it with you? Are you wanting to make God proud of you and your decision to follow Him? To make your Heavenly Father's day on Sabbath by saying, Father God, I want to commit everything to you. Are you that person today that's never been baptized before? Why put that off? Why today? Put that off. Are you that person today that maybe at one point you were baptized, but you've drifted away, and so that Jesus comes again, you know for sure that you won't make it? You've been totally deceived. You thought you were okay, but today you know you're not okay. Today, are you that person, and you need to make a decision? Or are you that person today that says, you know what? I have been on the rock, but the devil's pulling me off. And he's trying to cause me to build on the sand. And I don't want to build on that. I need your help today. Think about it, friends. If you're that person in that first category, today God's given you a chance to make a decision. To make a decision to follow him in the watery grave of baptism. I want you to join me right now. I want to sing that song, I've Decided to Follow Jesus. I can sing an a cappella, Margaret. Um, not sure if you know it. But I feel impressed today. There may be somebody here today that you have never responded before to a call to make a decision for baptism. But today is the day that you want to do that. And I want to invite Pastor Ian to come up. Um, and Pastor Tim, why don't you come up today, uh, you gentlemen. And I want you to join me up front. And please, today, if God's speaking to your heart, yeah, come today. If this is a call for baptism. You've never made that decision before. 
what do you think, say? Well, Pastor Mallory, I've made a decision for baptism before. Uh, what do you do at this point? You pray. So somebody here today, yeah, let's sing this song together. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Today, friends, if that's you, one more thing I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to come out of your pew and join Pastor Ian, Pastor Tim, and myself today. And we would like to have a special prayer with you after church today. I know this is bold. I mean, this is big time nervousness for some of you. But you know what? Jesus says, if you confess me on earth before others, he'll confess you in heaven before heaven. And so today, if you're that person, you've never made that decision to follow in the steps of Christ, to make your father happy by being baptized, I ask you today, as we sing this chorus once more, that you will come forward. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Maybe there's someone today, you've made that decision for baptism, but you drifted away, you've walked away, you've been building on sand lately, and you're noticing the foundation starting to get weak. You're noticing spiritually you're not what you should be. Today, you just want to say, I'd like to be rebaptized, rededicate my life to the Lord. I want to invite you to come as we sing again that chorus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Let's pray. Father, Thank you so much for giving us the story of the Sermon on the Mount. So much in that story. Jesus, you definitely were trying to reach a generation that were, in a lot of ways was totally deceived. They didn't understand everything. They thought that since they were going through the motions, that would be an automatic. But Jesus, you helped them to see that it wasn't automatic that truly they had a heart problem and they needed a new heart. They needed a relationship with you. And so, Father, as we think about them, we see ourselves in that group of people. In a lot of ways, Lord, we've been burning the candle at both ends, doing all these great things, but some of us are so dead on the inside. <laughs> and we feel like our house is going to crumble. The storm is coming. We know that's going to be the worst storm in history at the time of trouble, and we feel like we can't even get through the little storms because our faith is so weak right now. And so today, if you're that person, it's here, you didn't come forward, but you would like to say, Jesus, I want to make you proud today. Father, I want to stand for you. I want to be building on Christ. I want to be receiving his word, and I want to be responding to that word and living by that word through faith. If you're that person today, I want to invite you to stand right now. As you make your public stand for Christ, please stand right now if that's you. And Father, you see the people that have stood today. This is a time of recommitment. We know next week we're going to have our communion service. We're a chance to, in a spiritual sense, kind of like a rebaptism. But today, Lord, we just want to th say thank you so much that you're in the saving business and that we can come to you just as we are. Whether we've been in the church uh, for just a few years or whether we've been in the church for many years, 
we can come to you today, Jesus, and know that our salvation is secure in you. If you're that person, I'd like to invite you to stand right now in thanksgiving to God for his plan of salvation before we close this prayer. Again, Father, bless each person that's made decisions in their private way, whatever way, where we pray that your spirit will lead. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Christ's name, amen. Now today, friends, I just want you to know if you wanted to make a decision and you didn't have the strength or courage to do that, please talk to one of us. You can fill that card out. You can give it to us today before you leave. We're going to conclude today by singing a song that uh, very clear in Scripture what it's all about, Building on the Rock, uh, 531, Building on the Rock, and then Nate will conclude it today with our closing prayer. Father, thank you today for the words um, coming from you. Please give us the courage, Lord, to follow your will this week. Um, no matter what you have to do to us this week, Lord, just save us in your kingdom, we pray. In your name we pray. Amen.